between your morning class and this class. So, uh, but it, it, I think this will work out well. And then, like I was saying, this classroom is actually open right after. There's no classroom after it. So, like when we do exams, we'll just go right. I mean, we could do two hours if you want. Two hours to do the exam. I don't like the one-hour exams. They're too much pressure. Too much pressure to do that. Okay, so we're right in the middle of... For some reason, that's really small. I didn't fill the screen. That's right. Uh, we're right in the middle of talking about just do, going through this derivation. Uh, we've been putting together these equations of motion for different systems, right? We started out with this little mass spring damper. Later on, probably by Wednesday, maybe we'll talk why we do our cart on its side. It's just to account for gravity. Gravity makes things weird when you add it in there, but you draw this free body diagram, you sum up the forces, you set them equal to mass times acceleration. And what we did here is it set it equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration is just, you, it's the position, it's the second derivative of the position. So you kind of slip that in there, you end up with this equation when you apply uh, equilibrium, you rearrange, you put all the u's on one side and the other stuff on the other side, and then you have this equation of motion. We haven't talked about how to solve this equation of motion yet, but that's kind of where we're headed by the end of lecture today, we'll probably start the how to solve this differential equation. It's a second order, linear, non-homogeneous differential equation. Uh, and then we'll talk about solution methods. And then that's when you solve this, oscillations come out of it, right? And that's the oscillations. There's what the dynamics is, the vibrations, the thing uh, rotating or the thing moving back and forth. So we did it for that first. Then we did it when we derived an equation of motion for... Uh, the pendulum, then we did an equation of motion for the frame, and this frame is equivalent to that spring damper system, right? The spring damper mass cart system, it, it all ends up being the same, just how you handle the stiffness is what is different, okay? How do you, how, do, you know, how does this correspond to it? Then we went on to say, okay, well, what's the stiffness of columns? Like, how do you handle the stiffness of columns? Well, it depends on what the end conditions are. If you have a fixed fix, your stiffness of your columns are 12 EI over L cubed. If you have a cantilever, it is 3 EI over L cubed. And then there's all sorts of variations of, of different end conditions as well. So uh, that's kind of where we left off, right? It was this is defining what, what stiffnesses are for the columns, right? I did also kind of hinted towards like, this is how we model buildings. This is kind of where the equivalent lateral force procedure comes from is just, we assume it's a shear frame building. You have each floor is independent and we go from there. So we'll, we'll get into that later. So a couple of other topics on stiffnesses. This is all under notes on stiffness. A couple of other topics is what do we do when the columns are in parallel? So the, these are equivalent systems, right? This is a, a frame system. And then this is a mass cart system that's kind of flopping around out there. Right. Uh, and so in this system right here, both springs go through this. So we're going to contrast that to when they're in parallel. This is when they're in parallel down here. For this system up at the top, uh, they both have the same displacement. This mass moves a distance u. So spring displaces a distance u. Spring 1 displaces a distance 2. And spring 2 displaces a, a distance u. So, both, so that's what's constant in this one is the displacement. So if you look to see what p is... P is equal to K1 times U plus K2 times U. Right, so I, sorry. If I apply a load P on the end of this thing. Right, they both, if I apply load P, they both will displace a distance U. And so it's K1 times U plus K2 times U. And you can pull the U out of the same U. So you say P is equal to K1 plus K2 times U. And so then if you were looking at, right, this is the stiffness is what gets multiplied by the displacement to give you the load, right? So K1 plus K2 is that stiffness. So the total K is you just add them together. K totes. That's how you guys talk, right? Totes. Totes. Huh? Is that still, is that still, did you say totes? Does anybody say totes? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the cool people say totes, if you don't. I'm trying to be cool, so I'm trying to be, I'm trying to relate to your generation, right? Totes. So when they're in parallel, you want the total stiffness is just the two added together. If you have something when they're in, uh, 
in series like this, either you have one floor on top of the other floor, which again is equivalent to uh, two springs attached to, to the end of each other. In this case, how much this one displaces, this one's gonna displace, that is U1, and this one is U2. So that spring is gonna displace U2. Those aren't the same. Right? They don't have to be the same. In the previous one, they both went through the same displacements. In this one, they don't go through the same displacements. But what is constant is P. P gets the, the load P goes through K1 and the load P goes through K2. So what's constant when they're in series is P. What's constant when they're in parallel is U. Right? And so we do a little slightly different der derivation here. So you say U totes, U totes is equal to U1 plus U2. Right, the total displacement, it'll be both of those added on together. It'll be this displacement plus that displacement. Right? How much does U1 displace is going to be that load P over K1. And how U2 displaces, that's going to be P over K2. Because they both, they both are exposed to P. That's constant throughout. So you can calculate how much U1 displaces, how much U2 displaces. And so then this becomes... P over K1 plus P over K2. And then, so if we you write down U totes again, just write it again down here. U totes is equal, you can pull that P out. P times 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2. And again, the, what the stiffness is, is what gets multiplied by the displacement. So that kind of goes there. If we put it over there, then that's what that stiffness will be. What gets multiplied by the displacement uh, to give us that. So you divide by that. So then what it tells us our, our total stiffness, k totes, in this case, is 1 over the sum of the inverses when you have a, a system like this. Right? This is very similar, if you remember back to circuits, going way back. Right? Physics, there was this, right? There was if something was in parallel versus something that was in series and what the resistance was. It's actually the opposite. It's the opposite. Like in, 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 in physics and circuits, if things were in series, you just add them together. And if they're in parallel, then you did the, the inverse of the sum of the inverses. So it's very parallel to that thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Be with me? Everybody doing all right? Diving in. This is, I like this. This stuff is fun. This is fun stuff to me. Dawson, fun to you so far? <laughs> Diving in. So that's, that's kind of uh, some, some notes on stiffnesses there. Right? You know, this is actually even more complicated than this. This would be, this is a system where there's no mass right here. If I added a mass right here, if there was another block right there, well, then this, is, this doesn't apply, right? Because this thing moving back and forth is going to be affecting what's happening over here. And the things are like, that's multiple degree of freedom systems. That's the second half of the semester we deal with that. But if you just put two, two of these things together, this is how you handle them. The second floor has no mass. Yeah, in this case, the second floor has no mass. All the things are stacked up on the top. It doesn't make sense. I know. But it's worth, it, the book spends time discussing these, these notes and stiffnesses. Frame with two different what's that? It could just be a frame with two different size members. Yeah, all masses on the top. with with a mass up at the top. That's right. You could have a certain stiffness down here. These stiffnesses just wouldn't be the same. But there is no. You'll note there's no mass right there. No mass right there. That's the only time it applies. But when we get into multiple degree of freedom systems, you'll see it gets complicated. Okay, how about linear versus nonlinear? Right there's. This is going to be a big topic later on when we when we start diving into. Uh, this is going to be a big topic later on when we start talking about letting members yield. Like that's actually a mechanism that we use in earthquake engineering is we let members yield so it decreases the response. And so everything at the beginning is all done with linear springs, right? And then nonlinear springs would be something that yields, right? If you had a member that has a plastic moment or something like that, you have a nonlinear response. But, but when you're talking about linear versus nonlinear, in this case, just to make note, P is equal to k times u. This stiffness right here 
for the force deflection response, that stiffness is, or that, that slope right there is K. So if I want the relationship, this, this delta is, is the same as U, right? If I want force, I just do K times U. This is also P, the way we've been doing it. Uh, K times U would give us that, because that's just what the slope of that force deflection curve is. When it goes nonlinear, the only comment we're going to make here is that P does not equal K times U, right? It equals k times u in the linear range. This still is the stiffness. That guy is still k and one, k and one. Right? That still has a stiffness of k. But once it hits this point right here, once it hits that point right there, it, it's not no longer k times u. Right? It's something else. Right? It's whatever that yield stress is. So it goes up and then it yields, or or it goes nonlinear. It is with that. So everything we do to start with we assume that it's in the linear elastic range and it's in this range right here. This range right here. That's all, the only comment I want to make. We're talking, when we start talking about energy in a few minutes, we'll come back to these, but like, for now, that's all I want to mention. When you talk in stiffness, everything's in the linear elastic range, nothing's deal with it. Okay. All right, we haven't done this one yet. So this is still under, a, so that was just a little side note on stiffnesses, what you use for the stiffnesses. We're right in the middle of deriving equations of motion for all these different types of systems. So now this is the same system, mass cart system. I've dropped the wheels, but really imagine there being wheels there. But how do I deal with it? What I've added in there is this dash pot, this, this damper in there. Okay? And so equivalent, this system is equivalent to this system. Right? They kind of draw it in the book. They draw it like that. That's what the dash pot is. So that sucker on the right there has damping. It's equivalent to the thing on the left. So if you look at the free body diagram for this system, we've got... P acted to the right, and then we have back to the left opposite motion, we have KU like we had before, but then we have another thing, which is CU dot. But that's how those dampers work. You have a damping property, and it gets multiplied by the velocity. So CU dot is the velocity. That's what the force is coming back to the left. KU is the, the spring coming back to the left, and P is that... Uh, the load that's being applied, right? So if you draw our, our uh, 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 apply equilibrium here, dynamic equilibrium, if you will, so you P minus KU minus CU dot is equal to mass times acceleration. Some of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So what we did before is we put all of the U stuff together. So we get MU double dot plus CU dot plus KU is equal to P. How would you look at that? I wrote that down below. So these are like the special concentric frames that was in steel tube? The ones that yield at a certain point? Mm -hmm. okay. That's exactly right. We're, we're going to get to the when it yields and how it's dampening. That's kind of like the, that's a big part of this class. Yeah. So the damper is in effect both for tension and compression spring? Yeah, so no, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. It's, in, it's compression and tension. It has a zero point and then it acts this way and that way. It acts both ways. And, and I have a little, I have a little model, like they, they make these little dash pots for uh, RC cars. Right, so little dampers for RC cars and stuff. I have a couple in my office. Morley and Austin bats and ruined them because they glued them. To, they hot glued them together. Dawson, I'm talking about right? yeah, your counterpart. Yeah, they're your counterpart, right? So they glued them together so they, you can't play with them as much. So I should bring them, but yeah, they work both ways. What it is, what it is, is there's just there's a piston in there. There's fluid on either side of that piston. There's little holes in it, right? And so if you move it slow, then that, that fluid can flow through those holes really easily, right? And then it works both ways. If you pull it back this way, then they flows this way. If I push it that way, then they flow that way. And then, then, but if you go faster, then that viscous, the nature of that fluid, it, it's more resistant to that movement. So you go like that, and so it's harder. And then when you pull it, then it's easier. Or if you pull it slower, then it's easier. But if you go fast, it's, it's, it's slower. So same thing with swimming. Right, that's how you say, right? When, you, when you're in the water and you move your hands, that's how you're swimming, is if you move your hands rapidly, you get more resistance because of viscous flow. But if you move your hands slowly, then you drown. But in my case, the holder I've gotten, 
the more buoyant I've become. And I don't have to, I don't have to move at all in the water anymore. <laughs> I don't even need to wear a life jacket anymore. I don't, we talked about that. I bring this up to class. It's pretty amazing. Like, I've never had this happen. I just go out in the water and I don't have to swim. I just sit there and I just float to the top. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. That means I'm fat. But I just go out there and I just float. And my wife's like, wow, you could tread water a long time. And I was like, yeah, that's right. I'm treading water. I'm not just fat. But anyways, that's all viscous flow stuff. So that's happening inside this little damper is how that thing works. Okay. Uh, but then it is, it is an external damper. I'm going to point that out. There is... Do our buildings have external dampers on them? Typically not, right? They do make them. They do make them. You can put in, and, and I, don't think they, I don't think we got them in Montana anywhere, but you can actually put in viscous dampers that are the act, there's a brace that goes across that actually has an actual damper. But what we're, what we're, what we're the, the thing that we're modeling with this is non-structural elements. Right? Like if you take a building and you let go of it, right? So you pull it back and let go of this building. If you don't add a damper in there, the thing's just going to oscillate back and forth forever, which isn't real, right? Like you, buildings don't do that. Actually, no, I mean, no structures really do that, right? Because there's always something there that's pulling energy out of the system. We treat the non-structural elements and the joints and the friction between the bolts and things like that. We treat that as a viscous damper. It is not a viscous damper, but we treat it that way. We pretend that it's viscous damper. Viscous meaning like a fluid damper. There is this thing called Coulomb friction. We're going to get to uh, uh, yeah, Coulomb damping. That is where you model the friction. And, and it actually ends up being really close to viscous damping. Viscous damping is way easier, so we just model in viscous damping. But this isn't, the, the, you don't find these in structures very often. But we have to have something in there to make it model like the real world experience. The real world experience is that the, the oscillations go away. They don't oscillate forever. Something's got something's to get it to slow down. And that's why we add this little uh, viscous damper. In our case, a pretend viscous damper that's there, right? Or in a car's sake, they have real viscous dampers. They actually put those, the shock absorbers on there are actually the real viscous dampers. Okay. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So single division with moving support. So this is, a, again, we're just deriving equations of motion. Again, aren't solving this thing. So the way when we do start solving, we're going to solve free vibration first without damping. Then we're going to do free vibration with damping, which adds in like this CU dot. It's, it's kind of like the, our progress. And we're going to work on that. And then we're going to work on when it's equal to a forcing. We're going to start adding forcing functions to it. But before that, single degree of freedom with a moving support. So this would be a system where this is, this is earthquakes basically, right? So here's our system. We got the same spring mass system. Mm, a different color here. So this sucker, the ground is going to move. So we're going to call that UG. Then it's also going to have a velocity, UG dot, and it's also going to have acceleration, UG double dot. Right? There would be a case where the ground can move. Okay. Uh, and then, this is a really key concept, the distance between these two, between here and here, it's going to be, that's going to be U, and this is going to be U dot, with no G on it. The relative displacement between the ground and the mass, we're going to call u. And then how much the mass moves overall, this one right here, we're going to call ut for like u total. And this would be ut dot. And then it's going to have ut double dot. All right, and then let me just draw those same, same displacements over here. This thing is going to displace that, that, and so again, this base is going to have what it looks like in this system. They're equivalent to each other. This is going to be, that's going to have UG. It's going to have UG double or dot, and then it's going to have UG double dot. Then the relative displacement between the two, that displacement right there, we're going to call U, and it's going to have a U dot. It's going to have a U double dot as well. I left the damper out of this. You should probably put a damper. This one, too, has a damper. Just to put that in there to be concise. For them to be equivalent, they both have to have dampers in there. 
Okay. So let's, def let's define a couple of things. Uh, U total, turn that diagram, uh, U total, UT, is going to be the relative displacement plus the ground displacement. Right, so if I want how much this actually moves, this total displacement, I take this ground displacement plus the relative displacement in between. So the total displacement is going to be this guy plus that guy. How much does the ground move? And then how much does it move in between the ground and the mass? You add those two together, you get U total. You take the derivative of those, and it'll give you the velocities. U total velocity is equal to U dot plus U G dot, and U the or acceleration is U T double dot is U dot plus U G double dot. Okay, and that's just kind of defining stuff. Hopefully, everybody's following me there. Like, this is a kind of a key concept to get here. So it's it's. The total, the total displacement is the ground displacement plus how much it moves in between, right? And why is it important to know how much it moves in between? Because that's what the spring feels and that's what the damper feels, right? The damper, the damper doesn't feel in the spring. It doesn't see the total displacement. It just sees the difference between the total displacement and the ground displacement. That's all the spring sees. The spring, why we care what the spring sees is, is because the spring is your building. Right? Your building only feels U. It doesn't feel U total. It only feels U. It only feels that, that relative displacement between it. And that's important because we're trying to design the building, right? And so we need to know how much the building actually feels. It only feels that relative displacement in between them. So that's last U. So it's a double dot. Yep. That's a double dot. Thank you. That's a U double dot. Okay, we're almost to the, the point we're trying to make. So then we look at our free body diagram. We've got acted to the left. We've got, again, this only feels it's K times U. It's not K, K times U total. It only feels the relative displacement in between them. And then this is CU dot. And there's no other force. I didn't put, if you notice up here, I didn't put a P on this, right? This is just, it's there. We've got this mass and we start shaking the ground underneath or we've got this frame and we shake the ground underneath. We're not applying a load, we just shake the ground underneath it, okay? And so the only things we have on it is K times U and CU dot. The reason it's acting to the left is we're assuming those displacements are to the right. So if it moves to the right, it op these things act opposite direction of movement, so they're acting to the left. So if you draw our free body diet, or sorry, our equation of motion here, this is just minus KU, some are forces, minus KU, minus cu dot is equal to mass times acceleration. And now this acceleration is ut, right? What Newton's laws care about is how, what's the total acceleration of that mass. It doesn't care about the relative distance in between them. It doesn't care about just the ground. It cares about both of them, the ground moving and uh, the relative displacement in between them. So you put in u total over on the right-hand side, okay? But then u total, we can expand. This is just mass times u double dot plus u g double dot. Right? U, u total, just right over here, right there. I can say what u total is. It's just the relative, relative acceleration plus the ground acceleration. Those two things added together. Right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that u double dot out. And what you get when you do that is this. You just rearrange that equation. Let me get that. So there's our equation of motion for when the ground shakes. Okay. And the key takeaway there is that it acts the same as if there was a load applied to the top of it. Right? Mu double dot plus Cu dot plus Ku is equal to mass times the ground acceleration. Right? And so if you look up to... Right? There's, those guys are the same. Right? This system right here is the same as that system up above. That system up above is when there's a, a P that was applied to the top of this thing. And so when you have the ground shaking, it's exactly the same system. It's just now our P is mass times acceleration of the ground. That's, that's, that's really key. That's a key concept because that's how we do it in the real world. When we get into like the seismic design, right? 
the equivalent lateral force procedure, you're not going, I mean, really what's happening is the ground start, is shaking, right? And then that's, that's causing lateral loads on your structure. But how do we actually model it? We come in and we put a point load up on the first floor, right? It's the same system. That's just how, how we're dealing with it, okay? This is a little foreshadowing of what's happening. But that's, that's a key concept to get how, how that happened. So you can, it, it's all tied to the, the total displacement. That's what Newton's, Newton's laws are, are about, the total displacement that this mass feels. And then what the springs feel and what the damper feels is simply the relative displacement in between them. And then you just kind of add these things together and then that equation pops out down below. Okay? Any questions about that? That's the last equation of motion. Right? We have one more topic to cover and then we'll actually solve these things. Yep, we'll go down to solving. We might get that today. But so the last topic to discuss is energy. Right? Again, energy is very key in all this. How do we deal with energy with all this? So energy, force times displacement, that's how we define it, right? Force multiplied by this displacement that it moved over, right? In an integral form, right, this is just, this is total, but in an integral form, it is the integral of f dot du, right? If u is changing, f dot du is giving that. Uh, when you take the integral of something, right, it's the area, we're talking about areas, right? The area underneath curves. So the energy that's in a system is the area underneath the force displacement curve, okay? So that, that's, a, that's a really key concept, right? This is area, right? You remember that back to calculus. Area under curve, right? So if we're talking about linear springs, this is going back to spring energy, the amount of energy stored in a spring. If we talk about a linear spring under one cycle, we're gonna look at one cycle. I'll show you what happens under that one cycle. All right? It's the integral of KU DU. And let's see what that does for, for one of these things. So under, so it's that integral KU DU. And so we're talking force displacement or force times U. Again, U is the same as the displacement there. Under, when, when this thing goes out and I push it one direction, let's go out one direction. So it goes like that. So I've taken this thing, and this is, we're gonna go for, we're gonna do one whole oscillation. So this is just going from, oh, let me see if I can draw it over on the side here. That'd be one oscillation. It's going like that, and it's, it's displacing. Okay, so we're going from, yeah, let's, let me do it. Yeah, start at zero. I mean, really, it's going to start at different, but we'll start at zero to make it, the point here a little bit better. Well, let's do one. Well, we'll do one oscillation. So there's one oscillation. So the thing starts out at zero, and we go from here to here. This thing just goes like this, right? The, this thing gets displaced. And so the area underneath that curve is right here, right? And so you're like, oh, there's energy to dissipated. But really what's going to happen is when it goes from here to here, it's the same as coming back on that same curve. So this thing just goes right back. It goes right back down that same line, right? And now in that case, when it comes right back down that same line, the force is acting in the opposite direction of movement. And so then it actually, the energy, you're getting the energy back. So you're going one direction, you're losing energy in the other direction, or one, one direction you're expending energy in the other direction, you're getting it back. And so there's no area under the curve under this half cycle. And the same thing happens on the other side. It goes out, then there's, area, there's an area right here, right? But then when it comes back, it's acting opposite, and then we lose it again, okay? And so the point is, no energy is dissipated with a linear spring. It, you, you put energy into the spring, and the spring gives it back to you. That's exactly what happens. You put the energy into the spring, it gives it back to you. You put energy into the spring, it gives it back to you just hands it right back to you. It just keeps going. So this thing, if you just had linear springs without a damper, this sucker would oscillate forever. And that's what the solution shows you, is the thing oscillate forever. Something's gotta be there to pull the energy out of the system to make it stop oscillating, right? And so one, again, just keep lots of foreshadowing here, nonlinear springs will do that. They are going to pull energy out of the system, okay? And that's why we let things go nonlinear. So in this case, we go up like this, right? Under one cycle, it goes up to a certain point right there. Then it yields, 
and it comes out. So this is all, this is again, same deal, going from here to here, right? Except for now it's yielded, right? And then when it goes from here to here, it goes the opposite direction. This thing then comes back at the same angle till it yields on the other side. And then it comes across and yields on the other side and it comes back up. Oh, that should be the same angle. Something like that. And so the, in, the area under that curve isn't zero, right? The area under that curve is all this. And so then the point here on this nonlinear, you say the integral of f du is not equal to zero. So energy is being dissipated and the thing's slowing down and, and stopping. Mm -hmm. And not, not only is it slowing down and stopping, it's also reducing the magnitude of the forces, which we'll, we'll get into that way later. But that's a, that's a common thing. This thing right here is called a hysteresis curve. Like when you dive deep, when you dive deep into seismic design, you'll hear this term called like hysteresis curves and having a robust hysteresis curve versus a pinched hysteresis curve. And then like it's, it's behind everything in the, in the code. And this is what I've drawn is a very robust hysteresis curve, right? It's how much area is being dissipated. This, nothing. If everything stays linear, no dissipation. This right here, lots of dissipation and, and we're moving all sorts of forces and, and, and energy out of the system. Uh, Comment. Oh, you know, I, I, those of you that had a class with me for this is I, I love talking about yielding like this. And this is actually very applicable in this particular scenario. So I'll do it again here. Like we've, if you think about something yielding, if you think about a cart or sorry, a block on a surface. Right. And then you're applying a load P to it. Oh, sorry, with the, with the spring. Oh, well, that's not what I wanted. Not knowable. Spring. This always helps me to envision what's happening. When you have a, we have a cart on like this. If I start pulling on that spring, okay, if I take that thing, you pull on it, what happens first? Well, that spring, there's, there's friction on that, so there's friction in there. If I pull on that, I really want to make one of these. Lots of paper. Maybe some of special paper can make me this color. <laughs> <laughs> but if I take it and I pull on it, and the spring stretches at first, right? You don't have to use your imagination for it. The spring will stretch, and that's in here, right? Right in there. And then if I, if I pull on that and then I let go of it, then I just get that energy back. I put energy into the spring and then I get it back. It's like the top there. It just goes up and down. Or another way to look at it is it goes up and down in this region right here, right? If I pull and push it, as long as I don't go too far, that stays in that region. But if I pull it far enough, that cart's gonna start slipping, right? It starts sliding. That's equivalent to something yielding. Because once that happens, I pull it, and then and once I hit that point, once I hit a force like that, then that cart starts sliding along there. Right? We start sliding along, and that's the thing yielding. Right? This is exactly what's happening. Well, not exactly, but it's similar to what's happening when it's yielding. And then, so that cart will move, and then if I remove the load again, the cart stays put, and then that spring just, I get the energy from the spring back. And that's what this is. That's why it comes back at the same slope, because it's still that same spring, and I get that back. And then if I just leave it there, it has a permanent deflection. It's deflected that much. It's the plastic deformation is how far that cart has moved and I get the elastic part back. And then when I flip around the other way and I start pushing the other direction, that's right here. I start pushing the other direction, and so it's compressing this spring, and it, until it'll keep compressing this spring, and if I remove the load, it'll just go right back down. I'm stuck on this little line right here. Until, if I push far enough, I can get it so that this thing starts slipping the other direction. So it slips the other direction until it gets to a point, and then I remove the load again, and I get the compression from that spring back, and it comes back like this, and there it is. Right? And so the energy dissipated in this particular case, in the cart case, would be the friction that's generated between this and the displacement. And you can see how that's, that you're losing, that energy's leaving the system, right? 
because I, I, it's burning it up when I'm pushing it, I'm fighting friction. Once it starts sliding, I'm fighting friction, and I lose that energy, and then it stops, and I, pull, I get the elastic back, and I start pulling it the other direction, and it starts sliding across the ground. That friction, when it's sliding, is dissipating energy, right? I, I really like that analogy. Somebody taught me that once. I think I, I think I learned that like my fifth year of my graduate school. And I was just like, ah, oh, 10th year of college. I was like, ah, oh, man, that, I wish somebody would have told me that a long time ago. It's a nice way to think of it. I've been in college a long time. Like, at, like if I consider myself being in college right now, we're looking at 27 years of college. <laughs> Yeah, get a life, right? What's that? I know I do get paid, but I'm in college. I'm like with you guys. I'm like one of you guys, right? <laughs> yeah, you're not getting paid. You're paying. You're paying to be here. You totes one of us. Yeah, I'm totes one of you. That's right. I do it. Like I hang out with my my adult friends, and they're like they're like, man, you act like a twenty year old. It's like, well, I do hang out with them all day long. <laughs> It rubs off on you a little bit. Like I, and also, I am one of them, because look how hip and cool I am. It is, it is, it's starting to, to set in that maybe I'm not one of you guys. I think I'm starting to stand out a little. The gray hair a little bit. My son started high school this morning. Like, I was like, wait a minute, what, the, what happened here? <laughs> yeah, right. Kirsten once started a rumor that I was 60, and it was believable to people. <laughs> <laughs> It was believable to Daniel, M. Diaz, Elias. Elias, Elias thought that, he thought that it was a little weird. He either thought that I was a r really good shaped 60 year old or a bad shaped 40 year old at the time. Which I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. I can't, I can't do it. But the fact that it was feasible, like it could be. But every year I get closer. I'm 45 now. It's like, oh God, how the hell did this happen? Let me, let me have this, though. Let me think that I'm one of you guys, okay? Let me, like, when I say totes, yeah, like, throw that shit at me, yeah. I try to tell my kid that I'm, I'm actually cool, and he doesn't believe me. <laughs> he doesn't at all. He won't listen to anything I say. I was like, your dad knows what he's doing. He's like, no, you don't. He's right. Yeah. Like, look, look how cool I am, Tyson. The one that gets me is he, t he tells me sometimes that, my, that his friends' dads are cooler than me. And that's bullshit, because I've seen his friends' dads. So I'm way cooler than his friends' dads. <laughs> he can't get, that one gets me. I think he does it on, he, I know he does it on purpose. It's like, Logan's dad's cooler than you. He does this. Logan's dad's a dick. <laughs> no, he's not. He's <laughs> Yes, uh, Ben, it is Nathan McBride. Nathan McBride, do you, you work with him yet? He's over in iMeg, but you, you, aren't you at CT? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. Nathan, yeah, yeah, his son and my son are the same age. I like Nathan, I was just joking. But, but, his, uh, it, but he has, the, Logan has, or Tyson has said, well, like, Nathan's cooler than you, and I take it, I take it, I was like, that's not true. Maybe I'll bring, maybe I'll bring Nathan in, you guys can join, you can. Yeah, do. Maybe I'll bring Nathan in as a guest. He's a structural leader. I'll bring him as a guest speaker, and then afterwards, you could tell me who's cooler, me or him. It's, it's <laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to go, what's that? It's definitely not him. Yes! Yeah. And so then I'll bring him back in. Nathan's fine. I mean, it's fine. I just, I'm just cooler than him. It's the only point I'm trying to get. I forgot what I was talking about. Okay, so damping. Right, so if you want to calculate the amount of energy under one cycle due to a damper, you do Cu dot Du, which you could, you could calculate this, right? You could, you could work your way out. The book does it. The book goes through and actually carries out this integral over one cycle. And what it ends up being is this little oval. It ends up being an oval in the force deflection response. Let's see if I can... Oh, no. With the assistance... Hell yeah. Ends up being an oval, the force deflection response. So that's the area, that's the energy dissipated by uh, a damper. So that too, the area underneath the damper is not equal to zero, right? And which means that it is, it is uh, dissipating energy, right? 
And so that means that's how those responses, that's why it doesn't oscillate at the same response the entire time. It actually starts decreasing as you go along, right? And so if you apply an external force to it, obviously that is not equal to zero either. If you integrate P dot DU for an external force, that obviously is not, is not zero as well. That's all I'll say about that. I mean, because if you're adding energy, P is adding energy to the system. You have an external load that's applied to your mass. So clearly it's, it, it, it's adding energy to the system, right? And then what's really cool is kind of, do, we'll do this later, you come back to energy added to the system when it is, uh, when it is in resonance, this energy added to the system just like blows up, right? That's why, that's why you get resonance. Is it increases without bound. It'll just go up and then that's why, why things fail when you hit it in resonance because, resonance because that external force is adding the load. It's always acting in the direction of motion. Since it's always acting in the direction of motion, it's never dissipating energy and it, and it just keeps increasing. Whereas it, if, there's, if it gets out of sync, where it's like where the mass is coming this way and you're applying the load this way, well then actually that's slowing things down a little bit. And that's where you're getting that beating that I talked about before. It starts ramping up and then it starts beating and then it ramps up and then it beats again. It's, the, it's when the load is out of sync and then it dissipates a little bit of energy versus just always adding it to it. So the next thing, I don't know, I mean this is just to, this is, I pulled this from like a middle school topic on uh, that, I, that gave a little flew right over the heads. I, I did not aim correctly, but but it, but it was just on vibrations and stuff like that, just showing the energy in the system. And what this was was it's just a plot of it. It's just kind of neat to see. I don't know, just a, just a side note. Like there's the potential energy is that curve, and this right here is the kinetic energy. That one right there. All right. This is. Uh, one half oh, KU squared, and the kinetic energy is one half MU dot squared, right? One half MV squared and one half KU squared. So you have the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So right at the beginning, right at the beginning right here, when you start out, in this case, I've displaced it 0.5. It has all potential energy and all the kinetic energy is zero. And then as that potential energy goes down, then the kinetic energy ramps up. So that's when it's moving in the opposite direction. But always, if I take the kinetic energy and the potential energy and add them together, they all add up to the total, right? And so it's always that way. You take the kinetic energy plus to to the total energy and they're always equal. And so it's just kind of showing like the way it works when it oscillates, there's energy is always conserved. Down below is showing when you add a damper to it, so in this one, this guy is the potential energy. This guy is the kinetic energy, right? And then this guy, the blue one, is the damper. The energy from the damper. And you could see that as the thing oscillates, continues to oscillate. So it starts out, it's all potential energy, and then potential energy goes down and the kinetic energy shoots up, but it doesn't make it back up to to one there because the damper is in there as well. The damper has pulled energy out of the system. And so the, the kinetic energy and potential energy over time decreases, whereas the energy dissipated by the damper increases. It's kind of nice. I mean, so their topic and the, the topic of the, the, the talk was on energy and how there's like energy and springs and like the potential energy and kinetic energy and dampers and it's just like whew, whew. <laughs> just fly it over. They like the videos of the buildings failing from... They like that. What's that? Five minutes, yep. Let's, let's start this one here. We'll just go into this. So this is free vibration, no forcing function, no damping. So we start out as simple as we can get. The simplest we can get is free vibration. There's no P applied to this, and there's no damper, right? So then this is the, the equation of motion governing that, right? Now that is a second order homogeneous linear differential. It's homogeneous because it's equal to zero. There is no forcing function applied to it. Those are, the, those are the ones you should like. If you do one that's, when you, this is a flashback to differential equations, when it's equal to something, you have to find the homogeneous solution and then add on to it the particular solution. You remember that? What's that? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You're like, screw this. I still don't understand why you got to do both. Like, why can't you just solve for the particular solution? Why do you have to do the homogeneous and particular solution? Don't know. They just say I have to. I think I got it. I got it. I got it. I finally got it. Took a lot of work. But, yeah, it took 27 years of college. I get it. But see, yeah. yeah. I, I, I do now understand why the wheel doesn't fall. I got that one too. When you spin it in the dynamics and you hang it by one axle and it doesn't fall. I got that now. I got it. It's in my brain. Intuitively, I get it. I get it. I'll explain. If you guys want to see, I got it. Took me, again, 27 years. <laughs> teaching the class 12 times and then finally it makes sense to me. Okay. So here's the system. Linear system. One thing we haven't talked about yet is what do you need in order to solve differential equations? Initial conditions. Right? Or in this, or boundary conditions or initial conditions. Usually when you're talking about spatial derivatives and stuff like that, it, the primes, you're talking, about, you're, you're talking about boundary conditions. You call them boundary conditions. And, then, and when you're dealing with time, like we're in that time domain here, we talk about initial conditions. So you could do it either way. You, they're, they're both the same thing. So how many do I need to solve this? Two, Two right? You need as many boundary conditions as there are primes or dots is what it is. So, so it's a second order differential equation, so I need two boundary conditions. What do you think the boundary conditions end up being? Like if I was like, oh, let's solve this thing. What do you think the... Displacement times zero, zero. Yeah, so, so, yeah, exactly. So displacement at the very beginning, and then what else at the very beginning? The acceleration or velocity. You need one of those. You have, to, you have to confine it enough. Usually what we do, we do velocity. We do the initial displacement and the initial velocity. So in this derivation right here, we'll, just, we'll stop after this, but you go the boundary conditions... BCs or ICs, okay? And for this derivation, we're going to say U of zero is equal to U naught and U prime or U dot of zero is equal to U naught dot. So those are just, these are just constants. Right, that's it. We call it u naught and u naught dot, but they're just numbers, just straight up constants. It's, it's how much did you displace it at the beginning and how much initial velocity did you give it at the beginning. That's all that that is. Okay. So then we're gonna go through. We're gonna go through how to solve the differential equation. We're gonna do it the way that you learned how to do it, and then the book takes a shortcut. So then we'll we'll do the we'll do it the way that you would have done it. Like if you said if I if if somebody told me solve this differential equation. I would immediately open up Mathematica or MATLAB and say, how do you do this? Or my TI-89 will do it. Or, but if I was it, okay, you can't use those, then I would do it this way. And so I would, we're going to do it that way and then just kind of show you how it is. Then the book, then we're going to do it the book way where they kind of like, they cheat, they know what it's going to be, and so they assume, the, they assume the equation is what it ends up being. It's cheating. But we're going to get to that. And we'll go through there, derive the equation for oscillations, right? And it ends up being sines and cosines, and, and it's pretty sweet. And then we'll complicate it, we'll add a damper to it, and we'll solve the problem for damper. And, and dampers make things quite, quite complicated. It kind of blows up on us pretty quick. And then we're going to see that there's very few closed form solutions, and you have